Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome you back uh, to, uh, all to the main arena now. And I'm sure that each one of you would have learned uh, something from our uh, expert strategy session in two boxes, boxes A, boxes one and two. And uh, some cases were really interesting. I could see only one or two cases here. And with this, uh, we shall move on to the next session, uh, which is learn from the master session. We are one of the best in the field, Dr. Goran Stankovic, one of the founding members and the current president of uh, European Bifurcation Club. And we have our own master, Dr. Roni, master, uh, Roni Matthew from Lissy Hospitals, Cochin. I'm sure that our masters shall help us to enrich our knowledge and we'll have a good knowledge sharing today. And uh, with us, we have Dr. Sengu Tevelu, Dr. P.K. Goyal, Dr. Hemmas Siraimet, and Dr. Lakshman Das in the expert panel will be uh, discussing the, all the expert strategies with us. And to take us uh, through this session, I welcome uh, uh, our uh, very good uh, friend and very senior uh, Dr. Srinivas Kumar, uh, who is a senior consultant cardiologist and director of cardiology uh, from Apollo Groups of Hospital Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad, professor of medicine, Apollo Institute of Medical Sciences, and the founder of uh, FACT uh, Foundation, FACTS Foundation, and is uh, one of the founder director of TCT India Conferences, and CSI NIC chairman 2018 and 19, and past president APC CSI. And uh, with this, I request uh, Dr. Srinivas to take over the session and then go ahead with the moderation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Selvamani, for the, the opportunity and uh... Uh, for hosting, uh, congratulations for hosting this uh, ABC, another good uh, uh, interventional cardiology forum meeting. In these tough times, we all need to uh, appreciate uh, your efforts. And now we are going into another important uh, session of bifurcation. And on the EBC current guidelines, the latest guidelines, we have uh, none other than uh, the master, uh, Goran Storm, uh, who has uh, who is the main author for all these guidelines. And uh, Dr. Salomon looks very, very handsome in this photograph, which is projected here. Very nice. And uh, can we, uh, my co-chair, Dr. Sangatwar is also here. Is he there? Uh, or uh, anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. We're going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm very happy to host. I think Dr. Goran is waiting there to deliver his talk. And uh, with few words from uh, my co-chair, uh, Sangat Velu, then we'll go on to Goran. Over to you, Salva, uh, Dr. Uh, Sangat Velu. Hello, Goran, and uh, welcome to this uh, session. And we are very happy to have you again. And uh, as you know, Goran uh, uh, has been done a lot. He's one of the thought leaders and uh, one of the uh, uh, leaders who have done a lot of work on bifurcation. So we will be uh, learning from him on the, uh, the latest uh, guidelines on management of bifurcation lesions. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Goran. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for kind words and thank you very much for kind invitation to participate. Uh, my task is to uh, share with you some of the discussions during the last couple of years consensus documents from the European Bifurcation Club and uh, I don't have any financial interest to disclose related to this presentation. Uh, I'll start with European Bifurcation Club ethos of treatment for bifurcation PCI. So we try to recommend to keep it simple and safe, try to reduce the number of stents, respect the original bifurcation anatomy, and by implanting tubular stent, and doing proximal optimization to try to reproduce the original fractal geometry, aim for well-opposed and well-expanded stents with limited overlap, but of course the elective treatment of bifurcations with complex anatomy and diffuse involvement of both main vessel and the side branch usually may require two stent approach. One thing that I would like to clarify, and I think it's very important uh, to make uh, uh, clear uh, to majority of interventionists is that when we speak about provisional side branch stenting, this is not single stent. Provisional side branch stenting is actually our standard approach and it's our strategy and philosophy rather than technique. For example, when we say decay crush, decay crush is a two stent technique starting by 
stand in the side branch first. When we speak about provisional, we start at the first layer of complexity by stenting the main vessel with respect to distal main vessel diameter. Then we do pot to respect the original tapering anatomy. And by doing pot, we also open struts towards the side branch. And then we evaluate. This is the first layer. If side branch is not severely impacted, if it's not very large uh, side branch, in that case, we can stop at that point. We don't need to increase complexity. However, if side branch is compromised, next step is to dilate the side branch. And uh, uh, if it's still compromised and then escalation to side branch stenting is facilitated. So we have multiple layers. We can evaluate result at each of the layers and then we can add complexity only if needed, but we can stop after the first pot if side branch is not severely compromised. So how to do provisional according to the recent EBC uh, consensus document recommendations? We definitely suggest to wire both branches. We suggest to prepare main vessel to do predilatation, especially in case of calcium. Side branch dilatation is left to operator discretion. But of course, in case of diffuse disease, especially again, if it's calcified, we recommend also to predilate the side branch because we decrease the likelihood of side branch closure. Stent selection is the key. Recommended stent diameter should be according to distal main vessel diameter. And I see frequently most of the cases which are uh, selecting stent according to proximal main vessel diameter, which is then too big. And then we have carina and plug shift and we occlude or com completely compromise the flow in the side branch. So we need to start by respecting the anatomy. Smaller distal reference of the main vessel should be our guide to select the stent diameter. And then mand mandatory step of every bifurcation PCI is proximal optimization, POT. And this is the key. POT should be done before exchanging wires. And I'll show you examples and I'll uh, try to share with you why we decided on this. After POT, optional step is to go to kissing, usually just for the large side branch, and then optionally POT kiss and second POT. If we need second stand, we in that case recommend mandatory kissing balloon inflation. So let's first uh, describe the concept of proximal optimization or POT. You may appreciate in this cartoon that if you select stent according to distal main vessel diameter, we of course accept that at that point, when we implant the stent, there will be gross under expansion in the proximal part of the main vessel. However, by selecting stent according to distal main vessel diameter, we don't push carina, we don't compromise or we limited compromise of the side branch flow. Selecting the stent according to proximal main vessel diameter, as you may appreciate in the right hand side, actually causes a shift in carina and compromise of the side branch, which is difficult to correct afterwards because of the small space that is left after carina shift. Here is the example from the visible heart what happens in the proximal part of the main vessel if we stand according to distal main vessel. You see that our wire, if we don't do pot, it's so easy to go outside of the stent in the wrong place and go outside in the side branch completely going, uh, bypassing the stent. In the worst case, it can go also inside and then outside again so it's unpredictable because uh, fractal geometry uh, dictates diameter, but we need to be aware of this video. Please uh, keep your attention on this image because it really helps you understand why we can have difficulties on every uh, step following main vessel stenting because frequently we go outside with the wire and then our uh, balloon for the side branch also goes outside. When we inflate, we compromise the uh, main vessel stand and that leads to sequence of complications. This is also OCT done in the visible heart lab showing you good expansion distally. But of course, before we do pot grossly under expanded stent in the proximal section 
of the main vessel. And here is what pot does by inflating adequately sized balloon inside the proximal section of the main vessel. You can see here in these images, uh, we select balloon, which is uh, one to one according to proximal main vessel diameter. We try to carefully position distal marker just in front of carina, not to cross the carina, and then we inflate trying to stay inside the stent. If the length of balloon is too short, we need to repeat pot through uh, the, post, uh, the most proximal edge of the stent in order to completely oppose the stent proximally. And you can see also in angioscopy, this is the jailed wire, uh, but because of the difference in diameters, uh, we first need to deploy stent optimally. And now we can remove the wire and uh, recross distally. Also, if we do OCT, you can see that after adequate proximal optimization, we have good opposition of all struts. Next step is optional kissing. And kissing is done uh, in order to first fully oppose the proximal part polygon of confluence, we try to use short balloons, non-compliant, adequately sized according to distal main vessel diameter of daughter vessels. But the main advantage of kissing is that by simultaneous inflation of two balloons, you can appreciate that now we have carina, which is in the center of the flow. And if, in this case, if we do kissing with simultaneous inflation of two balloons, we actually create flow divider and the main role of the carina is to divide flow for two distal branches. However, when we speak about provisional, what is the currently available evidence for use of kissing in provisional versus two stand strategy? We summarized uh, for uh, editorial that we wrote in Euro intervention for the Excel study sub-analysis on kissing balloon inflation, uh, currently available published studies. And in the first uh, part, you may see uh, studies which evaluate the role of kissing in provisional. Only green one shows positive impact on, of kissing on clinical outcome of the patients. And only in Korean COBIS-2 registry, there was decrease in the rate of TLR at the follow-up if we do kissing. Majority of studies, including randomized Nordic tree study, actually did not show uh, any difference whether or not we perform final kissing balloon inflation. Uh, neutral result could be interpreted as if there is no advantage of performing kiss, but there is also no harm. And the only study is very early, again, Korean COBIS-1, uh, registry data in the first generation, non-standardized way that performance of kissing actually uh, made worse clinical outcomes compared to no kissing. So for provisional, we can conclude that by doing kissing, we actually remove the struts from the ostium of the side branch. We better expand the stent in the proximal part of the main vessel. And the third aspect is that we position Carina in the center. And according to all computational flow dynamic studies, uh, shear stress corrected uh, is uh, in, in case of the central uh, Carina position, and we have high shear flow uh, in the Carina area and low shear flow in the lateral walls. It's completely different for studies with two stand strategy because all available studies show positive impact of kissing balloon inflation on clinical outcome. Actually, I remember the time when I worked with Dr. Colombo, this is this first study that we used to do uh, crash stenting without final kiss. And that resulted in worse clinical outcome and was published by our fellow Dr. Ge. So according to this, we should do kissing in large side branches and of course, in case of compromised flow in the side branch. How to optimally perform final kissing? We should use, as I said, short non-compliant balloons. Balloons should be sized according to reference diameter of distal main vessel and the side branch. Uh, according to bench testing data, we recommend to start inflating side branch first in order to remove metal from the ostium of the 
side branch. We don't need a, a high pressure. We go to moderate pressure, eight to 12 atmospheres. And then after uh, having inflated the side branch, we start inflating the main vessel uh, balloon. We keep balloons inflated in case that patient tolerates well for at least 20 to 30 seconds. Because if we keep balloons for shorter than this, then acute recoil is very high. So actually we don't have a result of the kissing as it would be expected and we don't appreciate that from angiography alone. In case that patient does not tolerate longer simultaneous balloon inflation, we recommend to repeat kissing two or three times for 10 seconds. Simultaneous deflation is also very important for the central uh, position of carina. And uh, we also recommend to correct for oval shape deformation in the proximal section of the stent to do final single proximal balloon inflation. Actually, to repeat pot, to do second pot with the main difference that first pot should be done exactly in front of the carina while the second pot should be done a little bit more proximal. This is uh, the, the fact that we learn also in the visible heart lab because after stenting of the main vessel and after having done kissing, now we have metal in the carina section. And if we go too distal with our balloon, you can see that actually by distal position of pot balloon, you see here, we actually push metal and we compromise uh, with the metallic neocarina, the uh, side branch osteo. So this can be corrected if we realize on time, this can be corrected with second kissing balloon inflation and more proximal pot. I made this couple of uh, animations with my colleague, Dr. Mehmet Begovic to help our colleagues understand the position of European bifurcation club on specific technique. So this is provisional prevalidation of the main vessel stenting according to LED diameter, then proximal balloon inflation optimization, recrossing through the distal cell, then kissing balloon inflation and final pot more proximal than the initial pot. So this is what we achieve by following these steps. We actually create two different diameters inside the tubular stent with larger proximal and smaller distal diameter and wide opening towards the side branch. When we speak about two stand techniques, two stand techniques according to EBC should be considered for long diffuse disease of the side branch, for high risk of side branch compromise or difficult access. When planned two stand strategy is used, we recommend to do it in a provisional stepwise approach, finalizing procedure with T-tap or culotte technique from crossover stenting, but for operators with appropriate experience based on randomized clinical studies, we also recommend to do double kissing crush, especially for complex left main bifurcation lesions. Here is the algorithm of the European Bifurcation Club. We assess the risk of losing the side branch after main vessel stenting. And if we don't expect high risk of losing the side branch, we recommend classical provisional. And after provisional, we can do this stenting tap or clock. If we expect major concern regarding the lo losing the side branch after main vessel, as I said, for experienced operators with decay crash because of complexity, we recommend to start with plan to stand strategy decay crash. We can also do inverted provisional stenting from the main vessel into the side branch, doing pot, doing kiss, and then put second stent in the inverted culotte, inverted T or inverted tap strategy. The main difference between T and tap is the amount of protrusion of the stent from the side branch inside the main vessel stent. And if case that we have narrow angle, we can uh, cover fully the ostium of the main vessel stent of the side branch with the main vessel stent by pulling back stand from the side branch inside the main vessel, as you can appreciate in this cross section. However, consequence of pulling back and covering the uh, lateral wall is metallic neocarina, and you can see metallic neocarina in every T and small protrusion strategy. In case of 90 degree angle, we can do T stent, 
nothing and we don't need to protrude inside. How to do culotte? Culotte can be done as a provisional or as a, a plain side branch stenting first. So in this case, uh, we show classical provisional stenting main vessel first, then doing proximal optimization, never exchange wires before performing pot. After pot, we exchange wires, we open struts, we do final, we implant stent with minimal protrusion inside the main vessel, we do proximal optimization, and after that, we cross distal cell, do kissing, sequential, and then after that, we do final proximal optimization because by kissing balloon inflation, we create oval shape. This is mini culotte. Mini culotte means that we minimize the area of overlap of two stents inside the proximal part of the main vessel. And the last technique that I would, uh, would like to describe in steps according to EBC again is decay crush. So uh, this is of course technique that we learned from Professor Shaoli and Chen, who is also a member of our club. We work closely and according to uh, EBC, uh, after crossing proximal cell, we should do stent implantation in the main vessel and then pot in order to oppose stent proximally. Then we do second kissing balloon inflation and then we finalize procedure with the third pot. And I will show you again, just very important step of uh, crushing the balloon. So, somebody stopped sharing my slides. I can restart in here. Very important step is to understand after stenting of the side branch, So we deploy and then you see, we crush first with balloon sized according to distal and then we take bigger balloon to crush better proximal part. This is very important because by having two different diameters of crushing balloon, we are able to limit recoil and we are able to create really better space for further steps of optimization. Here is the result again in blue stent in the side branch. And you can see that here we have also small metallic neocarina, gray one, but in case of DK crash, metallic neocarina comes from the main vessel stent compared to uh, culotte. Uh, what about left main bifurcations? Uh, there is a specific anatomical difference, uh, wide angle, larger caliber discrepancy, more calcifications. If osteum is involved, uh, there is more fibrotic tissue. Side branch is never small, it's circumflex. And trifurcations are observed in 10% of cases. So in left main especially, pot is the essential. We need to know our stand design characteristics and maximum expansion capacity because we need to expand sometimes three, five to uh, five millimeter inside the left main. So we need to know which stent could be expanded without major distortion. Because of the wide angle, we should apply adequate technique, either T-tap or culotte, or double kissing crash from the beginning. And our toastial involvement means more elastic recoil and also risk of longitudinal foreshortening. In case of calcification, lesion preparation is very important. People frequently discuss the role of imaging. We uh, dedicated our consensus document in 2018 to left main PCI. And we said what I just commented, specific anatomical characteristics are important to understand. And our recommendation is uh, to use intracoronary imaging routinely for main, uh, left main PCI in order to make easier decision-making process during the course of PCI, but also to use intracoronary imaging whenever we see unexpected difficulties. And of course, at the end of procedure to make sure that we achieve optimal result with optimal stent expansion. DK crash is in the guidelines of European Society of Cardiology. And in those guidelines, we have class 
has to be recommendation that for true bifurcation left main PCI DK crash may be preferred over provisional. However, EBC consensus uh, says uh, wider uh, decision that in left main PCI, individual patient anatomical characteristics should be considered and operator skill when we decide on the technique. But for majority of cases, we think that provisional could be also effective. And this is just one of my case examples. A lady with acute coronary syndrome, diffuse disease of the right coronary, troponin positive and acute coronary syndrome was caused by distal left main and osteal LAD lesion. And even in this complex left main trifurcation, uh, how we decide on the strategy, we need to understand where is the lumen contour, where is the vessel contour. And in my interpretation, all of the plaque is actually in the lateral wall in front of the ostium of the LAD. So having stent positioned from the ostium into the LAD, we will compress that plaque without compromising the circ. So decision was provisional stenting to start. And then uh, according to Finet, uh, there is uh, at least 4.5 diameter of this left main. So uh, venture was used to cross in this difficult anatomy into the LAD. After putting uh, wire in the LAD, the rest was standard EBC recommended provisional. Three wires, predilatation of the main vessel only, stenting from the ostium, positioning of the stent in two orthogonal projections. After stenting, of course, expected compromise of the circ with combination of sh shift of the plaque and carina shift. And after doing pot with much bigger balloon, stent is 3.5, pot 4.5, result is much better. And then tracing after pot, I exchange wires, three balloons, tracing, and the final result with optimal and geographic appearance of the co-dominant circ, some compromise of the small ramus, but at least it's patent and TIMI-3. So even in complex anatomy, we can do left main PCI with the single stand strategy. DK crash five, however, for complex lesions, so the advantage of uh, two stand strategy up front, but we need to understand that the length of disease in the circumflex in DK crash five was a 16 millimeter. So we know from the Ben stent study that for such a long diffuse disease, stent is better than balloon. So in my interpretation, I don't think this is fair comparison because for such diffuse disease, I think we definitely need two stent strategy. It's just decision whether we are stenting main vessel first or side branch first. But in most of these cases, we need two stents so crossover rate of 47% for me is too low. I would expect 80% crossover because most of these lesions, when you predilate, you are creating dissection and you have to cover with stent. In definition two, length of the side brain disease is even longer, 20 millimeters. So what we learn from DK crash studies and from definition two is that for diffuse disease of the side branch, we definitely need two stents to start and not to do it crossover. However, for majority of contemporary left main PCI in the Excel, three year adverse outcomes were uh, worse for two stand strategy compared to provisional. I had privilege to write the editorial and I wrote that we need to individually assess. Uh, high um, MACE, uh, death MI and stroke at three years, starting very early in two stand strategy. And even if we include uh, ischemia driven revascularization, there is difference in favor of provisional and the same difference in favor of provisional in European noble study. So EBC main is our European bifurcation club study comparing single versus dual stenting for left main lesions. And our hypothesis is that provisional will be better than two stent strategy with respect to death, TLR and myocardial infarction at one year. I'm happy to share with you that recruitment was completed 1st of December, 2019. I congratulate the top recruiters and we will present results next year at PCR. So dear colleagues, again, I thank you for invitation. And uh, I would like to conclude that provisional side brain stenting, according to EBC recommended for majority of bifurcations, including left main. Technique of 
10 things should depend on individual patient's an anatomy, but also the operator's skill. Because for example, if you want to participate in DK crash five, operator has to perform 300 PCI in the last five years. And 20 of those need to be left main PCI. And now we have data from British Cardiac Intervention Society just published in Jack Interventions. And from all 1,700, I think, or 800 operators, only six operators in UK fulfilled criteria requested for participation in DK Crash 5. So I think that uh, for dedicated operators, DK Crash is excellent. But for majority of people, we need to learn other techniques and we need to be uh, experts in our own uh, either two stand strategy upfront or provisional going to two stand strategy. Uh, two stand strategy considered for diffuse, extensive stenosis of the side branch, difficult access on, or high risk of compromise. Among two stand techniques, there is strong randomized evidence currently for DK crash while we are awaiting PCR and the results of EBC may. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Goran, for uh, covering uh, all the aspects of bifurcation so well and highlighting some of the important aspects of uh, left main bifurcation. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, your uh, uh, video pic pictorials and uh, it is uh, self-explanatory. But I think uh, all of you agree that uh, though two-stand strategy, wherever it is used, has higher events and higher uh, problems on follow-up. But basically, it is done for higher complex uh, uh, procedural anatomy, patient anatomies. As you understand, as you yourself said, when the side branch diffuse disease, disease of more than 16 mm is there, obviously yeah. you will take the help of two stents. I think that should be considered. And exactly if you compare uh, the same anatomies, then it shouldn't be too much different unless the operator has done some problem. So exactly. we need to understand the complexity of the in, uh, in which we are working. And that's how I think uh, results uh, were bad in the two stent strategy group of Excel which were uh, used compared to one stand. Exactly. I, yeah. I think Thank you, Goran. I just want to add uh, just a few things. Uh, about your kissing balloon strategy, uh, when you use yeah. two stents, uh, we do individually high pressure in both the branches uh, before we go low pressure in the side branch and uh, main branch. Uh, this is what we do routinely. What we, This is not mentioned during your talk. So what do you do in your strategy when you use two stents for, for final kissing balloon? Yeah, thanks for that question. Very relevant, exactly. This is what you just commented. It's part of European Bifurcation Club consensus. It's called two-step kissing, and it's recommended for every two-step strategy, not just for double kissing crash. Also in T, TAP, and CULOT, you do separate high-pressure inflations individually, and then moderate uh, pressure uh, simultaneous inflation. It's more important to separately inflate at high pressure but the reason for high pressure separate inflations is excessive amount of metal that you have in that bifurcation. And by high pressure adequately sized balloons, you remove the metal and you oppose the stand in the areas of overlap. The other point in, for the purpose of the audience is to know the marker of the balloon, the length of the balloon which is protruding beyond the balloon marker. This is very important, particularly when you do a pot, because as Goran pointed out, it's very critically to, important to place the balloon just before the carina. So that is one important point. Other thing is, uh, Goran, I want your views on, uh, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, provisional single stand strategy followed by kiss or not to kiss. And you, you said uh, kiss may be better off. But uh, there were some interesting case reports when imaging studies were done showing a bridging, tissue bridging over jail struts. I think Roni had shown one of, uh, during the uh, EBC meeting, one of the meetings, uh, so I think that is also one of the uh, important points to consider doing a kiss routinely, particularly in a large vessel like left main. Yeah, you know, I fully agree with you. And this is probably something that we routinely do, especially us who work uh, with, with Antonio Colombo for many years. So we still do it. But according to available evidence, I don't have evidence to say uh, you should do it routinely. You know, uh, there is no penalty, but this is part of the practice that uh, uh, we cannot base decisions on uh, anecdotal cases. And uh, do you see uh, in imaging studies this uh, tissue bridges uh, over, over jail, jail side exactly. branches? Exactly. Exactly. I saw it, and it's a couple of individual studies, and there is thousands of cases.
this is without imaging and without casing, and we don't have difference in uh, clinical outcome. There is no dedicated study for the left main, but according to all computational flow dynamic study, casing should be better. However, we don't have clinical validation and we need to base consensus documents, something that you write on clinical evidence, not on anecdotal case reports. And finally, in the 15th consensus document, you had again given the importance for distal cross. But as you know, most of us are doing distal cross based on fluoroscopic, not on imaging. And I think it's particularly difficult to do. So whatever we do fluoroscopically, do you think it's acceptable, the distal crossing, and how much importance is it given uh, for this distal cross? Yeah, thanks also for that question. It, it comes very frequently, and people frequently would like to know how to cross distal cell. First, I, I had uh, that presentation uh, in, in the course of Antonio Colombo, and there was Jeffrey Moses, and they were uh, not, uh, not um, in favor of promoting distal cross because they said, I never removed the wire, whichever cell I crossed. I think when we discuss, especially at the fellows course, we should explain the rationale for proposing something. Crossing the distal cell actually allows you to push metal out from the ostium of the side branch and also by pushing metal to scaffold partially the roof of the side branch. And if you are able to cross distal cell, you actually partially uh, project some metal from the main vessel into the side branch. In case the second stent is needed, this will allow you less protrusion inside the main vessel because you already partially scaffold the ostium of the side branch. So your protrusion will be less than in case of proximal cross. Second, if you cross proximal cell, then when you inflate balloon towards the side branch, you push that metal from the ostium inside the main vessel stent, you understand? So you are shifting metal from the uh, struts in front of the ostium inside the main vessel stent. And then you artificially create metallic neocarina. And if you need to go with the stent, this metallic neocarina may prohibit easy passage of the devices into the side branch. So our goal should be to cross distally to, to make sure that you are crossing there are and geographically two small tricks. What I do usually when you jail the wire and when you cross your wire that you recross and jailed wire should be separated by one and a half, two millimeters at least because wire which is jailed is pushed by stent more laterally. So your wire that you recross can never go proximal to the jailed wire, should always be distal. And second, you can use stent enhancement software by using stent enhancement software, you can see position of recrossing and you can also see if you have some projection of the metal into the ostium of the side branch. If you see that projection, it means that you cross distally or centrally and not proximally, and this is good and positive sign. So I'm not asking you to repeat all this, but this is just the rational why we recommend distal crossing because it's safer for the patient you need less metal and you scaffold the ostium of the side branch with a single stand. Bram, can I ask you a question, Shirishia? Sure. Uh, the, uh, when you switch from provisional to a second stand, uh, yes. which are where you choose T uh, or TAP or culottes, these could yes. be the three options. But what about the bed preparation? I mean, we have not prepared the bed uh, like we would like to normally do with a hard balloon or a cutting balloon. So the ostium is that we're underprepared for a good stent expansion. So okay. aren't we paying a price? Uh, no, 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 uh, in case, so I said there are la layers of complexity that you are adding. You start stenting the main vessel, you do pot and you evaluate. Of course, we don't recommend routine predilatation before that point. After pot, if you have compromise of the side branch, then you exchange wires and then you predilate. And you evaluate again after predilatation whether to do second pot and finish procedure, or if the result is not good, you can do as the other option, kissing. What I personally prefer and what we recommend in the, in the guidelines is to do after opening the struts, you should do kissing. And then again, this is the next level of complexity. You inject, you evaluate the result. 
If the result is not good, you need to proceed with stenting. At that level, what you nicely said, you can go with non-compliant balloon or cutting, predilate nicely before going with the stent because before inserting more metal, you need to prepare the lesion. This is why provisional is stepwise strategy of complexity. And we are not saying stop with one stand, please. You can finish in 20% of cases with two stands, just go from one layer of complexity and then next one, next one. And when you are happy, you can stop. If you, if you start with one stand, you can always finish with two stands. And uh, bailout stenting means dissection and occlusion of the side branch, this is bailout. Having stent in the provisional in the side branch is not a complication. It's plan to stand strategy just with the stepwise decision making. You don't say from the beginning, this lesion I will do tap. No, I will start by stenting main vessel. I predilate the side branch, I do kissing. And if I'm not happy, I proceed and I put second stent. Yeah, I think you have said this many times that provisional does not mean one stent. Exactly, thank you. Yes, thank you. I think uh, that we have heard from you again and again. And I think we need to move on. Yes. Yes. Alumani is uh, yes, sir. reading it. I think uh, we'll have some more discussion after the sec uh, second talk uh, by yeah. Dr. Rani Matthew. I think Goran, you would stay for, uh, for sure, some time. Sure. I think uh, all yeah, of I'll us. Just, are, uh, I just uh, mute yeah. myself. Yeah. yeah. Many of the times we keep thinking that uh, which stent uh, would be better for when you're dealing with such bifurcation anatomy. There are some studies to share that open cell design is better. But let us hear more uh, of it uh, regarding the stent selection from Dr. Roni Matthew. Uh, over to you, Dr. Roni. You are muted, sir. We are not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, what I was saying was, I mean, after this wonderful talk from Dr. Goran about the techniques about stenting, I think it's equally important to understand that the design of the stent is important for bifurcations, especially to understand your side branch axis and your expansion limits. So to go to the historical perspective, I think we have moved from this single wire coil designs to a slotted tube, which was laser cut, Janta Rubin to Parma shards to multicellular stents. And now we are in this era of the open cell design. It's important for others to understand that, you know, stents previously were closed cell versus open cell. In the closed cell, each cell was connected to each other, while in the open cell, the connectors were only within two or three cells. Now, to understand this design a little better, let me take an example of a Zion stent. Now, this particular stent is made up of a succession of rings and connectors. Now, these are what are called the rings, and these are the connectors that connect the rings together. Now, each ring and the connectors make up a cell. So if you look at this cell, this is what is called an open cell. You don't have a connector here. You don't have a connector here. You have only connector here and here. So you get a large cell, and that is the advantage for a side branch axis. Now, these rings and these connectors hold together and give you the radial support and the longitudinal stability for the stent. Now, if you look at each of these cell, it comprises of a peak or what we call as a crown and a valley over here. This is just the anatomy of a stent. Now, each stent has its own characteristic anatomy, as I call it. A connector from here, from the peak to valley, is exactly in the Zines group of stents. 
when you have a mid connector to a, 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 a mid strut, sorry, a connector between the mid strut to a mid strut, that was the initial cipher design, which was subsequently taken by Pronova and others. On the other hand, if you look at the entire uh, 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 Metronic family, you have a single coil design, which are just welded in between three of these crowns. And therefore, you get a large cell here without a connector. And then you've got lastly the Boston group where the peak to peak is offset by a slanting connector. I will tell you the importance of this when we come to talk about the side branches. It's very important. It's just like the visible heart when you do an OCT. You can see the stent design and immediately tell which exactly is the stent. Here on the left panel, you can see a connector. That's the Zines. Here you do not see connectors. That's the Onyx. Here you see the, 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 the side connect attachments, and that is the Promus, and of course, the mid-strut to mid-strut, the Gensync. Something that very few people understand this. Each company makes only two or three stents. For this example, I'm talking about the Zines Expedition. They make only two types of stents. One stent of six crowns and one stent of nine crowns. And they mount this stent on a different balloon size so that you get a stent of three. But actually the stent of three and the stent of 2.25 is exactly the same stent. So this is one design they have, as I said, six crown. So you get three cells and the other is a nine crown design for a larger one. So that's between 3.5 and four. So if you look, there are these six crowns over here and therefore you have got a cell which has got two crowns in the larger one. You've got a cell that has got a three crown. Again, that's important to understand the side branches. So for a left main, a nine crown larger stent would be much better. Now, the second part of that, that's the expansion. The expansion entirely depends on this, which stent you use. Now, if you use a 3.5, if you look, you expand it, you can expand it to a maximum of 5.6 and you will distort the architecture and make it square. On the small cell, you can only go to a maximum of 4.1. So in this, if you take a three millimeter stent and you put it into a left main, that is 4.5, you are not going to be able to oppose the stent, whatever you do. So you have got to move to a nine crown design if you're using a Zines. Now, this is exactly the picture that I wanted to show you of a maximum expansion. A small cell design, this is how much you can maximally expand it to 4.4. A large cell design, you can go to 5.6. And this cutoff is at the transition between the 3 mm to the 3.5. So a 3 mm, 2.25 to 3 mm will only go to this maximum size of 4.4. You should not go to this maximal size because if you, if you realize over here, you change the, you distort that stent strut and that has its problems. Each of these stent from different companies have got a maximum size which you must respect. Otherwise, you will straighten the crown, you will lead to, lead to metal fatigue, increase plaque prolapse in between these struts and the scaffold will be less. Of course, there is a question of polymer fracture. This must be there on every cath lab to know which stent you're using, what is the architecture, and what is the maximum expansion limit. You must respect this when you go for bifurcation and left main stenting. Now coming to what Dr. Goran was talking to maintain the fractal geometry. Now, if you look at this left main, and I want you to listen to me carefully on this. you got a left main of 4.5. you got an LED of 3.5 and a circumflex of 3. Now, if you put a 3.5 millimeter stent, and you got to do that, because in this LED, 3.5 is the size of the LED, so you must put a 3.5 LED stent when you're going to do an LM to LED crossover. So when you do this, you get what he was talking about a uh, 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 malapposition in the left main 
because the left main you have to you have to respect the fractal geometry of the left main and therefore a pot is essential for you to do this now let's take a particular design again i'm going to go to the zines now if you want to do a crossover stenting from the left main to the led for example if the lesion is that we're going to choose a 3.5 and that's again a large stent design with nine crowns if you do put that stent this is how it looks you have a 3.5 here and you have post dilated the left main you have kissed and pot with a 4.5 and the geometry is more or less decent on the other hand now let's take the circumflex if you are to go to the circumflex to the left main you got a 3 mm circ Therefore, you go with a 3 mm stent, and if you put a 3 mm stent in a lesion like this, look at what you get when you do a pot with a 4.5. You spoil the architecture of the stent, you expand it to maximum limits, and you will get a lot of plaque prolapse when you do this. This is not only with this, with any other stent. Now let's go to another stent, and here I'm going to talk. talk about the boston stent the synergy group if you have a left main here of 3.5 and now a side branch and the led both of 2.75 2.75 now if you put a 2.75 mm stent and now if you look at the design of that from 2.75 to 3 they change the design of the stent and from 3.5 to 4 they change again this design stent So now, if you put a 2.75 stent, this is how it looks. You do a pot and a kiss with 3.5. You distort the stent because the maximum it can go to is only 3.6. It cannot go to more than that. On the other hand, if you put a 3 millimeter stent, this is how it will look. And when you do the kiss, the stent architecture is much better because if you realize here. the maximum expansion of this stent is 4.2 so the geometry is maintained this is how a stent design and a size helps you in defining the geometry oct shows this very well you look at the designs 3 mm put in the left main you look at the how the stent looks it's large cells now and after a kiss you can find out that this stent has got expanded really large therefore i believe you must not put a 3 mm zines into a left main you must go to a 3.5 now look at the onyx for example a 3.5 mm onyx into the left main it looks pretty good and if you look at the stent on oct you do not you have not expanded it to its maximum capabilities therefore there's less of plaque prolapse and the stent looks good so the oct is more or less like a visible heart when it comes to the bifurcation now this is the effect of a pot of a 3.5 mm implanted from the left main to led now look at the 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 oct you got the left main stent virtually floating in because you got only a, you have only expanded this to a 3.5 while your left main is 4.5 and if you look at the cross section as it runs through you can see at the left main the stent hanging inside so to maintain the fractal geometry you got to post dilate this so you do a pot with a 4.5 and once you do a pot you see on the oct very well the stents well opposed and opened in now what is the effect of a kiss and dr goran was again speaking on this during the discussion now here we put a stent across the diagonal into the led the steps that he told talked of do a pot then subsequently you recross it distally very important and then you kiss it and then you do a final pot so how does oct helps help us in defining how we have done well and this is where i'm going to tell you what he was just talking about you have taken the distal strut here you have expanded the stent if you look at the l view and you look at the stent you look at the pot here the different geometry of the left main here proximally and the led here the left main is large and what he was talking about that strut is pushed into the side branch and scaffolds the side branch you look at this strut here 
it scaffolds the side branch and helps you do a T stent very easily into the side branch without really protruding into the left main. What about a lack of pot? Now, in this case, a stent was implanted from the LAD into the left main. And if you look, it was a 2.7540 T post dilated with a 3 NC. The result looked good. But again, you have not respected the fractal geometry. This patient comes back with angina. We see haziness in the circumflex ostium. Now, if you look at his OCT, you see very clearly this 2.75 stent that has been taken to a 3 stent, but it's virtually floating in the left main over here with because the pot was not done to a left main size. And if you look at the run that takes place here, you look at the circumflex ostium, struts are there, there has been growth over there. In the left main, the stent is hanging and there is a growth there. So there are two issues with the stent. One is the side branch where you have not kissed and this left main where you have not done a pot. Now, if you look at the 3D bifurcation view at that circumflex ostium, you see all the tissue in growth having a fenestrated circumflex ostium because you have not kissed and removed the strut from the side branch. And if you look at the, the run-through view from the left main, you look at the left main, the stent is hanging here and you run through here. You've got space here between the stent and the wall and you can make it out very well on OCT that this was this needed proximal optimization. Side branch is yet a different issue. For lack of time, I'm not going to speak in detail. Suffice to say that in these cases where you do an LM crossover, when your circumflex does not have much of a disease, in both these cases, you get good results with a crossover. But I believe that if you land up with a strut across the side branch, you must open it. Otherwise, you will land up with a fenestrated circumflex ostium, as you have seen in some of my cases. Distal cross, very important, because in this, if you similarly see a stent from the RCA to the PLV has got a strut right in the center, you can see very well on OCT, you're crossed distally. And when you do a kiss, you get a perfect uh, opening without any neo-metal or neo into the side branch. So to end my talk, <clears throat> I think stent design and capability is very important in bifurcation. And when we talk of capability, we're talking of expansion. Of course, these are the attributes of the stent that we're going to use for any lesion, but the design and expansion limits are absolutely important when you plan a bifurcation stenting. Expansion limits in the left main, side branch axis, depending on the design that you have. You must know your stent before you stent bifurcations. Thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Roni. Uh, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, Roni, uh, actually, as you pointed out, you showed in your OCT image also, uh, not uh, when you showed a three millimeter stent in the left main, there is also that there is a less footprints in the left main when you expand a stent too much. And when you have a particularly a large plaque burden, and uh, this can also lead to more plaque prolapse and, uh, and uh, less scaffolding. So that is also another important point to size the stent properly when you over expand it, particularly in uh, dis discrepancy in the sizes there. The other uh, important point, which I think you didn't mention was uh, about the longitudinal stent decompression. Because when you select a stent, particularly for the left main, I think we have learned from the Excel trial, there was about 7% incidence of uh, longitudinal stent decompression and double maze in patients who had uh, uh, this longitudinal stent decompression. And of course, the stent characters are important in selecting, particularly in a left main situation. So I think the current generation stents have good uh, strength, but still uh, I would like to avoid uh, certain stents and probably a uh, Zions or uh, Onyx stent would be definitely better off uh, in, a, in a left main or steel stenting. Absolutely. I do agree with that because uh, 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 I, did, I didn't mention that, but 
in the stent design when you've got an offset peak to peak like uh, uh, what we have in the promus group a longitudinal compression is more common but then must appreciate that that they have designed the stent better right now and the strut that's connecting between the offset peak to peak is much better and you do not get longitudinal compression in their newer stents and longitudinal compression is also associated with your guide that goes and hits into the lm ostium if you do not perform it well so there are many reasons for this longitudinal compression rather than the stent design itself so and uh, the importance yeah yeah and, uh, because of lack of time and it was uh, definitely an excellent uh, presentation by both of you sir and uh, we have learned a uh, lot of new things and uh, both presentation by stankovic as well as roin roni met a great presentation it's not a simple routine presentation which we have seen here excellent demonstration and uh, definite i'm very sure that all of our viewers would have learned a lot of things A special thanks to our international faculty dr goran stankovic